The information and opinions presented in this Arc Energy Ideas podcast are provided for informational purposes only and are subject to the disclaimer link in the show notes. This is the Arc Energy Ideas podcast with Peter Tertzakian and Jackie Forrest, exploring trends that influence the energy business. Welcome to the Arc Energy Ideas podcast. Well, it's a little bit different format today because I'm on my own, but I do have a wonderful guest. So I'm very happy to introduce Peter Altmeier, who was the German Minister for Economic Affairs from 2018 to 2021. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you uh, for inviting me. And thank you for a wonderful debate we have had around all the energy issues that are so important and in Europe, not so much different from what you were discussing in Canada. Right. So, well, just to give our listeners some background, we just attended the Petronas International Energy Speakers Series, which is hosted by the University of Calgary's Huskane School of Business. And Peter is the guest this year, came all the way from Germany and told us all about what's going on in Germany and obviously lots when it comes to energy. But maybe we'll start, you know, you, you're a close confidant of Angela Merkel. So tell us a little bit about working with Angela. Well, I had the honor and the pleasure of uh, working in her team for more than 20 years as a friend, as a parliamentary first secretary, as a minister in different ministerial posts. And uh, she is uh, a very, a very committed person. She is uh, interested in uh, international issues as well as in domestic issues when it is about uh, people, about individual people. For example, she was uh, very much active in order to fight uh, Ebola disease in Africa. When it occurs, she has done a lot of helping younger people in Africa to get better education. She was uh, interested in uh, international cooperation as well. And of course, when um, you work for such an extraordinary person, it is uh, sometimes demanding. We have been friends, but I have been in different functions, always the one to execute what was decided uh, in government in uh, between uh, the federal states uh, and the national level in the European Union. And uh, I terribly enjoyed it. And I believe uh, she is certainly one of the most important politicians in Germany uh, in the last two centuries. Okay, good. Well, you know, with that insight of, and and yeah, we talk about your time as Minister for Economic Affairs, but you had other roles and ministerial roles previous to that. But let's talk about energy because that is the real situation that's making the news. We've obviously got the real war, which is a human tragedy going on in Ukraine today, but we have what we're calling an energy war in Europe. That was actually the title of one of our recent podcasts. Uh, Germany is really at ground zero in that war. So what is it like on the ground? You know, are people fearing this winter? Are companies shutting down their production? Like what's happening? To well, you? nobody knows um, how severe winter will be this year. Uh, nobody knows what will happen on international energy markets. My uh, guess is uh, that from my previous experience, from the figures I have seen as far as gas storage in German facilities is concerned, I believe um, we will manage to have a um, reliable gas supply, even this winter without Russian gas. Germany and European countries have bought enormous quantities of uh, LNG gas at the spot markets. And therefore, when speaking about energy war, it is not just about Europe, because um, when you have a rally at the spot markets for gas, then it concerns Asian countries, emerging countries like Bangladesh, like Thailand, like Cambodia. There is, for the time being, and probably for two, three or four more years, not enough gas available on the world market. The Russian gas is missing. They cannot simply export it to Asia because there's no pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no um, LNG uh, capacities for doing it. And that means that um, all the other countries are now competing and racing for gas supply. Europe will be in a relatively um, good position. In Canada and in the US, you will have lesser problems than we have in Europe because um, you are self-supplying uh, to a bigger extent. Germany was producing more gas in the past, but uh, according to this um, phenomenon that is uh, called NIMBY, not in my backyard, 
in Germany, uh, the uh, gas production has collapsed by half over the last couple of years. Why? There's no majority for using shell gas in Germany. We have enormous quantities of uh, reserves in that. There is no consensus about exploiting um, natural gas that we still have in the coastal areas of the country. And therefore, Germany is relying as an industrialized country, much more than other countries do, on the import of um, energy and uh, especially on the import of oil and gas. Right. Well, you got into my next question a little bit, which is, I think a lot of people look at the situation and say, well, how did Germany allow themselves to get so dependent on Russian gas? Like back when you and Angela Merkel were in the positions thinking about this, did you ever think, fear a scenario like this? by relying more and more on those Russian pipelines? Well, we were in the government always concerned about a development where domestic production was shrinking, where important European suppliers were no longer supplying, like the Netherlands, Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, will stop production of gas because of the fear of earthquakes in the coastal uh, areas. And then the point was, can we afford imports uh, from uh, other countries uh, with LNG gas in order to uh, become more diversified uh, with regard to Russian gas. We were ready to uh, arrange for that, but the private sector in uh, Germany was not ready to pay a higher price for gas than uh, they had to pay for the Russian gas. And it was a reliable supply for more than 40 years. It never happened. And um, when um, uh, Russia so unlawfully attacked uh, Ukraine and started this unlawful war, then there was first a debate in Germany whether we shall still buy Russian gas. And then uh, under the impression of a potential change in the German attitude, Mr. Putin used gas as a weapon as long as he could use it, that is now. But we have managed, nevertheless, to buy gas in other countries to fill our storage capacities now at 95%. Right. Um, yeah. They are full. And that means we have not been as dependent as it has uh, sometimes uh, been said. It has been very expensive to buy the gas elsewhere. It has been quite uh, demanding, quite challenging to find it and to buy it. But we managed uh, to do so. As a matter of fact, in all the previous years, uh, Germany has benefited from relatively cheap energy. And that was also important because the renewables, we have expanded faster than almost any other industrialized country in Europe, have been very expensive. And uh, and therefore, the business was interested in cheaper gas uh, and not in more expensive ways. Right, yeah. So economics drive these decisions where when energy security isn't rating very highly, I think people may look at energy security a little differently now because you had so many years of, yeah. of not having to worry. Uh, let's talk about these pipelines. So Nord Stream 1 and 2, there was uh, sabotage. We still don't know who did it. But how bad is that, losing those pipelines in terms of Germany's future energy supply? Well, um, I believe that um, most of the problems have already been um, overcome because Russia stopped in summer of this year delivering gas via Nord Stream 1. At the moment where Nord Stream 1 collapsed, there was zero gas supply through that pipeline. And that means the situation has not been aggravated. We have not yet, a, still not yet a clear picture on who has done it and how big the damage is. But we suppose it's a big damage because it was a very skillful terrorist attack against it that private persons probably cannot uh, conduct. And the second thing is, there is a still uh, intact pipeline, Nord Stream 2. But we have very clearly explained to Mr. Putin already last year that uh, Nord Stream 2 will never, never uh, become operational if the Ukrainian crisis would aggravate. And this is exactly what he did by invading Ukraine. So uh, I believe that um, the Russian gas import has come to an end for a foreseeable uh, future. 
So it's a loss of infrastructure that you were never going to use anyway. So I guess from Germany's perspective, it's it's not much of a loss. Now, do you see a scenario? Obviously, it's hard to predict the future as the events of the last few months have, have taught us, but where Russia could sell gas to Europe again, or have they shredded their reputation forever? I would say Mr. Putin has shredded his uh, reputation forever. Uh, that's that's for sure. That uh, will not be healed, uh, even not in a generation. The question, what will happen if Russia one day becomes a democratic country, is pure speculation today. Nobody knows whether it happens at all, and when it happens, and whether it will last if it happens, and then uh, even if Russia becomes a democratic country. It will depend on the uh, agreements that um, the German importers will sign with exporters from different countries in the world. For example, we are now negotiating LNG supply from United Arab Emirates and mm -hmm. Qatar, and they all insist on a quite a long period of obligation. I'm not authorized for giving you uh, figures about it, but... Um, it's quite long, and uh, I can imagine that if uh, Canada one day would decide to export uh, LNG more than it's doing today, then they would be interested in long-running agreements and obligations as well, and that would have consequences because we uh, will import as much gas as we need and, uh, and not more. Right. So even in that scenario of Russia becoming a democracy, you've already made long-term agreements yes, with I, others I, I, and, I, and there isn't much room. Yes, I, I expect something different to happen, honestly. In the past, Europe had access to relatively cheap Russian pipeline gas and most of the um, Asian countries, including China, but also emerging countries like Thailand or Bangladesh, had to import more expensive LNG gas. And this is something that uh, can and potentially will change because if Germany and Europe now will sign up to uh, long lasting agreements uh, with countries like Canada or the Arab countries for LNG gas, I expect a new Russian government to build pipelines to Asian countries in order to export the gas, but that will take three, four, five years or even longer. Right. So for a foreseeable period of time, I cannot see how Russia can sell its gas. And therefore, we are looking of increasing gas production in other countries worldwide. Okay. So, you know, even if Russia doesn't become a, a nice state, I think they'll find buyers maybe in some countries, but it will take time to build those connections. You talked about those long-term contracts. I know you, you're you not going to tell me the number of years, but I'm assuming they're multi-decade type <laughs> contracts just from what a I'm few decades. Yeah, <laughs> hearing few about. Decades. So, you know, Germany and Europe want to get off hydrocarbons. So isn't that a conflict, signing these long-term contracts? I mean, that, I think that prevented Germany from signing them in the past. That was one element of why you didn't. Yeah. Um, uh, Germany is um, a signature country to the um, Paris Climate Agreement. And uh, we have decided to be even more ambitious. And in the follow-up of a judgment of our constitutional court, we have enshrined in our legislation that Germany will become climate neutral by 2045. That means we still have more than 20 years. And in these 20 years, we will need natural gas, LNG gas, shell gas in considerable amounts. The demand will even further increase in the coming years because the um, gradual and um, expansion of renewable energies will make it unavoidable of phasing out of coal-fired uh, power plants. They are not flexible enough and therefore uh, we would not reduce CO2 emissions. And that means that the role of gas in Germany will increase, certainly over the next 10 years, perhaps even a bit longer. On the medium term and long run, however, it seems in my view likely that natural gas, as from the year 2035 approximately, will be substituted more and more by um, so-called hydrogen, green hydrogen. This is a new technology, or it is uh, for the first time 
that an old technology will be applied at a very large scale. Uh, that means you can produce hydrogen gas from renewable energies like wind or solar, and then um, you can use it in electricity production, you can use it in heat production, you can use it in the industry, and then it's climate neutral. So I see a gradual transition, and this is part of energy transition, from natural gas that will achieve its peak by the year 2030, and then it will slightly but steadily go down and um, see an instead an increase of uh, green hydrogen. Uh, by the way, you can produce hydrogen also from natural gas, and it is called blue hydrogen, mm -hmm. but uh, under the condition that you capture CO2 that is a byproduct uh, of it in a um, climate-friendly uh, way. That's a technology that exists. So I believe that gas producers will have a business model for many, many years still to come. And it is not just the German and European gas demand. The demand for gas will increase around the globe because all the coal-fired power plants will be switched off one after the other in order to um, achieve the Paris climate targets. And that means an increased role for gas and in some areas uh, also for oil. Okay, so we're going to go from coal to gas. And I, you know, coal, by the way, people may be surprised. We, on an energy equivalent basis, we use more coal than gas today globally as a source of primary energy. But let's talk about hydrogen. I have to say, some people are skeptical about hydrogen here in North America. Why? I think they're skeptical because, especially as an export business, you know, it takes a lot of energy to make it, it yeah. takes a lot of energy to ship it to Europe. Yeah. And it, it's quite expensive. Do you think that? you'll be importing a lot of that hydrogen or will you be producing it domestically? And and why would you need to import it? Well, you could just a, use water and the sun, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. We need to import it because Germany is a relatively small state, densely populated with uh, lots of um, industry. And uh, we are committed of producing almost 100% of our electricity demand from renewable energies by the year 2045, and that means uh, we will have to double and to triple our onshore and offshore wind parks, our uh, solar panels. So I'm afraid that um, there is simply not space enough for a 100% domestic supply. Germany today is importing 77% of its primary energy demand, and that will not fundamentally change in the future. Other countries where lots of sunshine, lots of wind, and um, unpopulated areas will have much better conditions for renewable green hydrogen. We will produce uh, five gigawatt uh, in the next couple of years every year. It will increase from some 100 megawatt to five gigawatt uh, up to 10 gigawatt after the 2030s. That's a, re a new renewable power each year. You're adding five gigawatts. No, it, it is in total 10 in Germany. And this is seen as a pilot. We need much more than just 10 wow. gigawatts. We need ten, much ten, more. More than 10 each year. Yeah. Right. And just for your power side. Exactly. Forget about hydrogen and some of the other needs. Yeah. And uh, no, the, the, we are talking about hydrogen. Okay. That will be used to substitute gas. It will be used okay. to substitute coal. It will be used uh, to substitute uh, other uh, nuclear, uh, for example. And we cannot produce it at the lowest prices because Germany has relatively few sunshine and not so much wind. Therefore, we do it just in order to demonstrate it is possible, it is feasible. Germany has a very strong position in uh, producing uh, electrolyzers, which are needed to produce green hydrogen. So this can become a win win situation that countries, with a lot of wind and sun and water and um, sufficient uh, space, will start uh, green hydrogen production. Germany will auction enormous quantities in the coming years and uh, will also try selling its uh, electrolyzers, which you need to produce right, green right. hydrogen. And uh, that means after the big oil tankers, after the LNG chips, a new energy infrastructure will emerge, the right. global scale 
at global scale. And that is, of course, interesting for everybody who is involved in energy business. It's a new business model, and you can earn a lot of money by implementing Right, right. It will be expensive, though. I think um, the energy losses of shipping hydrogen are high. You know, you talked before, the reason there was the dependence on Russian gas is it was cheaper. Do you think that people are willing to pay more because importing hydrogen is probably going to be a pretty expensive source of, of energy? Well, there are so many questions, and not for every question there is a clear answer yet. We know that it's expensive. We know that the transport is risky because hydrogen cannot be safely kept. It can pass. Even steel can pass everything because it is the lightest element mm -hmm. uh, in the elementary system. But this is one of the reasons why there is a competition. For example, in Chile, I have financed um, a model project for green hydrogen in order to produce thin fuels, renewable fuel for combustion uh, engines. It is um, co-financed by Porsche. That is a famous German car manufacturer. And people who can afford a Porsche can certainly afford the thin fuels uh, much more expensive than uh, normal right, uh, right. fuels um, if they want to have some joy and enjoy themselves. And now the point was, when, when I started the project, I hoped that Chile would produce a green hydrogen. It would then be shipped to Germany and the thin fuels would be produced there, as all the fuels are today produced in Germany and by the refineries. And something very strange happened. Porsche said, oh, it's very difficult to find the infrastructure to ship it already today. Chile said, oh, that's not a problem. We can produce the thin fuels uh, in Chile. Right. First, you produce and it's hydrogen. easier to ship that. Then, yeah. then we produce the thin fuels, and then you can ship it with traditional ships, and uh, it's much cheaper. Yeah. And that is a, um, a on the first place a pragmatic solution. On the second look, uh, it means, however, that uh, Germany will lose uh, some uh, production sites that we still have today. It's all a question of jobs. Uh, the same is true for the steel industry. You can produce green steel, climate neutral steel by substituting coal through uh, green hydrogen. Uh, but of course, there are uh, already today very attractive uh, offers from uh, countries uh, like the Scandinavian countries and others to say, oh, we have so much green hydrogen that we can easily produce or blue hydrogen. Why not to produce the steel pellets in our countries? And then you can further process them in Germany but that, of course, means that part of the steel production will be outsourced. So politics shall not uh, interfere in entrepreneurial decisions. That is my personal conviction. But as a politician, it was always my overarching interest to preserve industrial capacities in Germany, because I believe that Germany today is a good country to live because we have still a very important industrial base. And this is something I would like to preserve right. for the future. Right. Yeah. Some really important points there, right? You can, first of all, we don't know what solutions come over the next decades. You know, we're talking about today, but it could be that it forces some of that industry out of Germany, but governments can overcome that by sometimes uh, putting subsidies in to uh, make that energy cheaper and, well, and continue to-, to, to not, but, but to But to say, frankly, what, what we are doing, we are providing no subsidies for um, ordinary production processes. What we are doing is in order to compete with China, but also the US, uh, paying subsidies in some areas or applying higher tariffs for customs is simply that uh, we subsidize very highly innovative uh, projects. And then the first mover technologies are uh, subsidized with the authorization of the European Commission. It is called the important project of common European interest. And we have, for example, spent more than 5 billion euro to establish battery cell production in Germany. But we will not pay any subsidy for the production process that has to be competitive by its own merits. What we have done was to help transferring the technology. Right. Uh, to get Europe. it started. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so the Americans, we'll, we'll get on a different topic. Americans are choosing to subsidize the production for clean energy now. But let's talk a bit about nuclear. Very quickly, uh, you have three existing plants, I think, in, in Germany that people think, some people think should be shut down. Others say because of the energy crisis, 
We need to keep them running. And then there's also the question of the future. Could you use nuclear, have new nuclear replace the need for some of that natural gas? Just in general, the history has been, you know, since that Fukushima incident, Germany took a pretty strong position against nuclear. Do you think that changes as a result of this energy crisis? Well, as far as public opinion is concerned, it has already changed. After um, uh, the Fukushima incident, 80% of the German people were explicitly against nuclear energy. And uh, today, 80% are in favor. That has uh, totally shifted. But uh, the main problem is that um, we have already uh, shut down most of the nuclear power plants we have had in the past. There are only three remaining. They are producing only 6% of the German electricity demand. This is still important in times of crisis, certainly, but um, it is only a small part of the solution and certainly not the entire uh, solution that we need. Right, right. Because you only have so many plants. I guess there's in the future technology could change in small nuclear, but that's interesting that people's support has changed so drastically. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Canada. So Chancellor Schultz visited, I think about a month or a little bit more than a month ago, and there was a couple of messages. He was told by our prime minister that LNG off our East Coast doesn't seem economic. However, there was a uh, an agreement to start shipping that hydrogen that we were talking about in the future. You know, what's your reaction to that? Would well, you like to see LNG from Canada? Well, first of all, uh, I'm I'm um, a little bit proud uh, because cooperation with Canada in the field of green hydrogen and renewable energies started one year ago when a memorandum of understanding was signed between my counterpart in the Canadian government uh, and me. It was during COVID, uh, so we had to do it in a video ceremony. But uh, that was the starting point, and this will continue. As far as LNG gas is concerned, I'm pretty much convinced that um, the German companies would prefer Canadian LNG gas from some other countries. But the question whether you want to produce it, whether you want to export it, is a purely domestic decision of Canada, where I cannot and will not uh, interfere being a German person. That is uh, that is the point. I mean, sometimes I'm asked, why did you not stop the import of Russian gas uh, earlier? And then I said, yes, because uh, there was uh, no cheap alternative. Uh, the business was not interested in Germany in that. But uh, I can even not remember that a single politician from one of the gas producing countries knocked on my door and said, oh, Peter, we have an offer some very interesting LNG ships to provide you with our gas. It did not happen with the Arab countries. It did not happen with other countries as well. Why not? Because uh, there was a, a very flourishing world market for LNG, especially the Asian countries, and not having pipelines with Russia, were relying very much on LNG uh, gas. So now the question is, as I see it first, whether people in Canada want to help energy transition succeed by taking part in the transition process. And that means um, satisfying part of the growing gas demand worldwide. This is the issue you have raised. It has to be answered by the Canadian people and the Canadian companies and the Canadian authorities. And we cannot prescribe what you shall do. But if Canada would come to the decision and to the conclusion that uh, export of more LNG gas would become an option, then I'm sure there will be a lot of interest from the side of uh, Germany. Yeah, well, thank you for those thoughts. I mean, the couple of messages there is like, yes, if there was LNG from Canada, there'd be demand or interest in it in Germany. There'd be a willing customer there. And I think a very important part that maybe not everyone understands in Canada is that, or accepts, is that gas is part of the energy transition yeah. and we are going to need gas. And if we're going to have a, what we like to call an orderly transition, you're going through something quite disorderly right now. We are going to have to have enough hydrocarbons and natural gas to support that. With that, I, I just really appreciate you coming all the way from Germany to Canada and sharing your perspectives. It's been a fascinating conversation. Well, I enjoyed it uh, as well. Wonderful people fascinating discussions, and I wish all people in Canada the very best for the future. 
Well, and we hope that everything goes well and weather is not too cold this winter and that 94% gas storage gets you through the winter uh, as you were predicting. And uh, hopefully the next several years, you will find that gas that you're looking for. All right, to our listeners, uh, if you like this podcast, please rate us on the app that you listen to and tell someone else about us. For more ideas and insights, visit arcenergyinstitute.com.